Today, uh, we'll be looking at Psalm 142 and Psalm 13. So we'll be in both passages. And as I was thinking over the room in which we stand right at this moment, I realized that we have a lot of folks who have gone through hurt. As I look around, I see, and I know of dads that have passed away, accidental deaths, children whom you've lost. Some of you, military and police, you have experienced death, and you've, you know what it's like to experience loss. Some of you have experienced the loss through disease that took family members. I look around and there's not hardly anyone in this room that has not been touched by tragedy. And as you and I think about heavy losses and painful situations, I want us to think, as you have lost loved ones, every one of us, we realize, has been jarred by tragedy. And uh, today I want us to learn to lament your sorrows. I've titled the message, Learning to Lament Your Sorrows. How does a believer mourn and process sorrow? When we go through grief, through death, through losses, through disease, through cancer, and all of the like, what should the Christian's way of processing pain look like? And today I want us to think about that. We know that how we grieve and how the world grieves should be different. We grieve with hope. We, we're anchored into that 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. We grieve with hope. But when the phone call comes and you get the phone call, like I have gotten the phone call at different times, that someone has just passed away, one of your relatives, your mom, whoever it happens to be, and you get that phone call. Others of you, when you hear gunshots and loud noises, it jolts some of your PTS memories. They come back to you. Vivid sensations of IEDs going off and losses around you. We're told in our world that it's okay to cry, and it is okay to cry. But does the believer have something, another tool, another tool that is more than just crying? And today I would like to propose to you that one third of the Psalms is written as lament. We do not practice lament that much, but basically it is this call that God has given to us to pour out our anguish, our pain in cries before God. When you come onto the scene, when you come into the situation, when you receive the text, the email, the social media of whatever sort, and this horrible news has come across to you, and you drop to your knees, and you say, God, I don't know how to handle this. That is lament. When you come to God and say, God, I, I don't know what's best here. God, would you spare some lives? When you get the phone call and you don't know how many will live or die. We pray, God, you know what's best in this, God. I put it into your hands. I cast it over. And God, I ask for your power to be seen in this. Sometimes we ask things of the Lord. God, would you spare people when there was no way? Sometimes our mind will play tricks on us. I hear voices. I hear people. Those, I don't know how many times I've been in death scenarios where people said that no one else is hearing it. But it's, we've only known them as living. And when they've passed off the scene, it is hard to reconcile with what we've always known. Meanwhile, the curse is looming heavy upon this world that's falling apart. And the curse of death has taken another life. Today, as we go through this passage, I want to ask, as we go into Psalm 142, you may be asking, what is lament? Lament is not the same of crying. I'm quoting this from Pastor Mark Verogob, and he has said this, it is not the same as crying, it is different. It's uniquely Christian. As I've mentioned, one-third of the Psalms are written as lament. They're prayers to God of our sorrow, and they come up before God. The whole book of Lamentations is a heavy sorrow of the, the slaughter of the Jewish people, man, woman, and child, the burning and looting of the city as it was destroyed, and they were carted off. And going through that, you hear the bleeding heart of Jeremiah the prophet as he looks around and he sees the carnage all about him. 
And as that's taking place, he cries out before God. You see, lament turns toward God when sorrow would tempt us to turn away from God. Quote, unquote, Mark Bergrup. He also shared this, Lament is different than crying because lament is a form of prayer. It is more than just an expression of sorrow or the venting of emotion. Lament talks to God about pain. It is a unique perp has a unique purpose. Trust. Underline that. Trust. That is the purpose of lament. I cry out to God and I say, God, this hurts. God, I don't know what to do. And you know it's like... I know I'm loud and I apologize. I, there's, I, have a, I have a loud way of mourning and I will try to rein that in. But there is, we sometimes have these heavy, heavy yells that come out. Make sure they're yell to God that says, God, I can't do this and I need your help. God, this is more than I can handle. And you know what? It's like a trip hammer that just has to keep going off as you walk past people who are coming onto a scene who have just lost another, another relation to that family. And you feel it as it's going off. And in your heart, you have to come before God and say, God, I put my frustrations, my sorrows before you because I'm confident that you are the only one that I can trust. You see, as you come through... The, uh, the concept of lament. I will share a little bit something from the Nelson note, but I want you to look in your Bible, Psalm 142 first. Psalm 142, if you're not there. <clears throat> cry out to the Lord with my voice. I cry out to the Lord with my voice. To the Lord, I make my supplication. I pour out my complaint before Him. I declare before him my trouble. Isn't that, isn't that rich? God's like, I want you to declare before me what's hurting right now. The thing that has kicked you in the gut like nothing ever before. Would you cry out to me? I want you to. And David, he's in a cave. He's been running for the last 13, 15 years from his father-in-law Saul, who has tried to kill him, thrown spears at him, brought armies out to destroy and kill him. His wife is back in the castle. He's separated. Everything is ugly. And David is going on. How long, O oh God? Psalm 13, verse 1. He was the one that penned Psalm 22 that Jesus would quote on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God, this is so heavy. I don't know how to handle this. This is lament when we cry out before God and say, God, this is more than I could ever handle. You know those crushing times when you're brought to your knees and your legs can hardly hold you. And you come before God and say, God, I can do nothing. I just ask for your help and your assistance. Here in Psalm 142, God wants you to lament. He wants you to lament. That is a prayerful talk to him about your pain. So you trust him through it. God wants you to be talking him about your pain. So that you learn to trust him. Rely upon him through it. These seasons can become the most intimate times of your entire life. As God draws you to himself. In dependence upon his son and his spirit. My first point as we have looked at verses 1 and 2 is go to God to cry out your complaint in faith. You, you cry out to God your complaint in faith. Now by complaint, I don't mean whining to God. I don't mean a sinful anger. It's not getting mad at God. But do you remember what your God has said in 1 Peter 5, 7? Cast all your cares upon him for he cares for you. Do you realize that God wants you to cry out to him? The word cast in the Greek, ek below, to cast out, to throw upon him. God's like, I want you to throw upon me the weightiness of this. When my mom was killed, my second mom was killed in a car accident, I got mad. And I was talking with unsafe relatives. And I was mad. How could someone be doing over 100 mile an hour and, and take my mom's life? And, every, and who knows if my other siblings are going to live and my neighbors if they're going to live. Taken to three hospitals, life flighted across the state of New York. 
And I'm like, well, who's going to live? We didn't know. And I was mad in the emotions. That's sin. It's not okay to just get angry at people. It's not okay to have suspicions run wild and say, this is his fault. This is her fault. If this hadn't happened, do you remember Job's friends when they say, what if, if only... There's the wrong questions. The question, the only question you can ask is, God, I don't know. God, I put before you the why, but it's not a disrespectful why. God, I pour out my heart. I don't know how to handle this. I don't know how to process this. When you're sitting at the table and, you're, and you hear a new report of alcohol or you hear this or that and you're like, you get angry. Put it in check, Christian. You're, you put it before God. God, I'm tempted to get angry. And I love it that one of my unsaved relatives reached out and said to me, John, that could have been anybody. Could have been you. Any, any one of us could have been speeding at over 100 miles an hour and pulled off something like that. This is just how it was. There's nothing we can do about it. You know what? I find people often need to hear there's nothing we can do about this. The what-if game will not lead you closer to people. It'll lead you further into anger. Be careful of the what-if game. Come before God, crying out to Him. Notice, here, it's not a sinful rehearsing of your anger, but instead, I would like, notice in verse 1, oh, you know, if you turn on the clicker, I apologize about that. So, there's our prop. We're in Psalm 142. First point, go to God to cry out your complaint in faith. Your complaint in faith. Your complaint in faith. And then I, your sub-point, A, verbalize your struggles to God. Verbalize your struggles to God. Here, you have the intensity of David. He, notice, did you see the subtitle? It says that he was in the cave. Um... He was he, a prayer when he was in the cave. This is when he's running from Saul. He's got about 600 men that have banded with him. And the Bible tells us how these guys came together and, and followed him. Um, that he had with him distressed men, debtors, and discontent men, for, according to 1 Samuel 22, uh, verse 2. Why? Because Saul has raised taxes. He's done everything to pressure, to kill David. He is putting all kinds of constraints. And a few, who does he have for his comrades? A bunch of renegades almost. And yet they become the mighty men of David. And they follow the Lord and they stick with David. But David is crying out, verse 1. I cried out, hear this going out with my voice. He's cried out aloud for help to God. Lord, would you please give relief in this? This is heavy. I, he's verbalizing this. And notice twice it comes up before him, before the Lord. He has brought this up before him. The psalm is pouring out a complaint, Alan Ross says. And the verb stresses to follow, the follow of his cry for help. Here the prayer is described as my complaint and my trouble. The nature of the prayer is a lament. The second relates to the need for prayer, the trouble. And uh, as we think about this, you can almost put it together. I pour out, God, before you, my complaint, my trouble before you. I tell you this. God wants us to talk to him with this pain. You know what Satan would love for you guys to do when you go through pain? He's like, you don't know what to say to God. God, can God be good? Has he been whispering that lie for a long time? Can he be trusted? I mean, why is this happening to you? And anytime you get into that why me mentality, the self-pity funnel goes down further and further away from God. You need to go toward God. And God's like, I want to hear your pain, not because it's mean, but because you need to verbalize it to me, your God, that you would find me as your trust and as your faith. David Jeremiah shares that at least eight different psalms during the years that he was fleeing for his life are written as lament song, are, are written in his fleeing, if you would, uh, as running from his father-in-law. Today, 
I want us to continue on with verse 3. Verse 3 in Psalm 142. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then you knew my path in the way in which I walk. They have secretly set a snare for me. Uh, it's interesting, no one in verse, the next verse, no one has acknowledged me, but God knows the secret things. He's in a cave in remote areas. God, you know everything. Do you know what he's doing? He's anchoring back into his God. When you are overwhelmed, seek solace in God's providence. You find God, oh, there is a sweetness, there is a solace, there is a safety, there is a haven in my God, and you go there. One of the sweetest things I've ever learned was after my second mom, my first mom died. His dad said, we're going to pray. And at the grave, we prayed for a new mom. We prayed for a new wife. We prayed for our family. We prayed for our family members that God would help. And every day from that day on, we prayed as a family at her bedside for 15, 20 minutes, just pouring it out before God. And it was the sweetest and best thing that shaped and changed and transformed my life. You know, I heard today, you guys are suffering today because of this tragedy. But I still heard singing in the church. Why is it? Because our heart yearns for the hope of the Lord. Because we, want, we have to anchor back into Him the solace that He is. Some of you are singing in the background by faith. Some of you are singing, He will hold me fast. Why? Because the Christian has a song in the midst of tragedy. Not glib, not, not something that's bubbly, goofy, or fake, but something that is anchored into a precious God when He takes you by the gentle waters and you're anchored into your God. Verse 3, you see that when I am overwhelmed... Here the psalmist makes um, no, uh, it doesn't sugarcoat this by any means. He's like, I, th I've been overwhelmed. This is heavy. There is a, a weight, if you would, to this that is hitting him. And he brings it before God. David's spirit is growing faint. Enemies have set traps in the fields, in the paths. It's almost like the language of landmines all around him. I know they didn't have landmines then, but that's almost a military picture that we see. Here, the sad commentary, no one cares for his life, verse 4. But he comes before God and says, Lord, you are my everything. In the midst of being overwhelmed, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to rest in you. I look on... We not only seek solace in the Lord, see, when you are lonely, cast your confidence in God's faithful awareness. Cast your confidence in His faithful awareness. Verse 4, look on my right hand and see, for there is no one who acknowledges me. Refuge has failed me. The word refuge, uh, it, refuge is escaped. It's like, it's fleeting. Um, it, the word failed me, it's to escape, failed perish from me. I, I, it's, it's gone. Uh, Nasby uses the word escape here. No one cares for my soul. As he shares this, can I mention this? You are tempted and are lonely often in sorrow because of the bereavement, because of the loss. But here we come to our God and says, God, you know this. You're with me. I'm going to read later Psalm 139. God, where can I go from your spirit? If I were to grab hold of one of the wings of the dawn, one of the sunbeams, drop out to the sea and drop off to the bottom into a watery cave down below. Behold, you're already there. God, I can't outrun you. God's all present. The Lord is near the brokenhearted. Is that what your Bible says? He is a God who is close. He holds all my tears in a bottle, the Bible says. Why does he mention that? He mentions that as the tenderness of your God toward you. He has an immense love for you. Here, David cries out, while no one can help him, 
He's like, God, you are the one who cares. You are my confidence. In delayed silence, seek for God to hear and respond. Turn back to Psalm 13, would you please? Psalm 13. The word overwhelmed, David Jeremiah says, literally means in the muffling of my spirit. God, I, I feel muffled. Cry out to him, David says. Rest in him. Pursue God. When he said he felt overwhelmed, do you know how bad it was? Do you know the entire dwelling place of Nob was killed? Why? Because the priest of God at the tabernacle of God gave some bread and a... Did they give a sword there? I'm trying to remember. To David. Do you remember that account? And what happens to Nob? We have someone that... An enemy, a foreigner, who comes and he tells Saul, who's bitter and angry, and all the priests of God are killed there. A whole dwelling place wiped out. And they were doing good. And we're like, how do I make sense of all of this? Friend, this world is short. And that's not very consoling. But do I believe heaven is better than earth? When a little one dies, do I believe heaven is better than earth? This is one of the struggles we have. This is true loss that we go through. True pain, true bereavement, it is not to be light. And it's something that does impact us for the rest of our life. And we look back to it, and it, there is a hurt and a tenderness there. But do I believe heaven's better than the earth? Do I believe that I have not seen, nor ear heard, nor entered in the thought of man the things prepared for those that love him? Do we believe that? I think that might be 1 Corinthians 2.9. Do we hold on to that as a treasure? Today, as we continue on, and look, if you would, in your Bible in Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Here the psalmist cries out in verse 3 and 4, Consider, that is, uh, God, would you look upon me with favor? That's the word consider. Would you look upon me with favor and hear me, O Lord my God? Enlighten my eyes. God, would you give me the favor of light so I can see through some of this? Lest I sleep the sleep of death. Let my enemies say, lest my enemies say, I have prevailed against him. The psalmist clearly says David feels forgotten. He, he feels he's talking to, to himself over his griefs and God has him in lament call out to him. And uh, we also need to verbalize your trust onto the God of loyal love. Look in verse 5 and 6. But I have trusted in your mercy. The word mercy is the word Hebrew word chesed, loyal love, steadfast love. God, I, I have trusted in your loyal love. How many times have I seen families in this church who have been comforted? We had a baby die years ago. And now we have another one. And what do we do? Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Another man put it this way, Jesus loves me, this I love. Isn't that good? God, you love me and I hold on to that. In the sorrow and the ache, we remember I have a God who loves so faithfully, so loyally. He holds me. We're going to sing a song at the end. He will hold me fast. Based on Psalm 139, verse 9 and 10, he is not going to let go. Amen. He who has begun a good work and you will continue it until the day of Christ Jesus. And I hold on to that. I rest in that. But Lord, I, but I have trusted in your mercy. Do you see the emphatic contrast? God, how long will this be? Verse 1. God, I don't know what to do. This is true lament. He's crying out the pain. 
and he moves through and by time he gets and, he, and then he has a request enlighten my eyes consider me hear me Lord he, help with this situation verse 5 and 6 but whatever your answer God I trust in you I trust in your loyal love I rest in you my God in Psalm 13 the word consider means to gaze intently to look into something God you're able to peer into all my needs would you peer into this Meanwhile, not only do I know you're all-knowing, but Lord, you are Lord, all caps. You are my covenant God. You are my God. You're personal, and I hold on to that. I'm not trusting my enemies, how I can outwit them or anything. I trust in you. You know, the Christian Psalms 4.8 remembers, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. We remember casting all your cares on him, for he cares for you. We remember Philippians 4.19, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And we say, God, I, I just come to you for all of your help, all of your assistance. As we cry out to God, we lament. I also want to touch on something else. I know I shared this few years ago in a Job sermon when we went through the book of Job. But I share something that comes from the Journal of Modern Ministry by John Stone Street. And uh, the particular author of this chapter, I mean, I think it was Pyle, Jim Pyle. He said this, when you talk with someone in a time of death, please be careful not to be glib, trite, to speak lightly of the death. This was heavy. Well, this was the Lord's will. That's the wrong answer. Knock it off. Don't do that. Don't worry. God will give you more children. That's a horrible, sickening thing to say. Don't ever say something like that, please. I've had people say things to my dad. No, you can't. No, I'm not going to give you a contact number for, you must be under the judgment of God. I'm like, oh, Job's friends are still alive and well. <laughs> be careful of what you say. Don't, you don't have to say anything. Remember when Job's friends were comforting to him? When for two weeks they didn't say anything. When you just hug, love, care, listen, help them process. This is not about you. Make sure that you have genuine love that's about them. Be careful of saying other glib things. Oh, God works in mysterious ways. I know how you feel. I understand. No, just, I hate to say it, shut up. Don't say that garbage. Even if you've gone through the same valley, I'm so sorry. That hurts. I'm praying for you. I'm so sorry. Just keep on saying, I'm so sorry. I love you. That's what they need to hear. Just keep on loving them. Keep on encouraging them. They don't need to hear stupid things like, you're taking this too hard. Or say that the loss of a spouse. Oh, there's other fish in the sea. Um, I'm not even going to say some of these. They're just disgusting People come up with all kinds of trite, stupid things, and they are stupid, where we just don't respect the life. The lives that were lost are precious, and their loss is precious in the sight of God, and He loves them. He is the father of the widows and of the orphaned. Isn't that what your Bible says? Not just once, but multiple times through the Psalms. You have a God that has an intimate name just for widows. And what are you doing saying, oh, there's other fish in the sea? That's just dumb. Beware of saying the things that are just careless. Beware of sharing things of suspicion. And never, ever, ever tell someone God is punishing you. That is a popular, stupid notion that people have. Do you have the gift of interpretation that expired a long time ago? No, you don't. Let me just tell you straight up. Never tell people. Maybe 
Maybe God's punishing you. No, we don't know any of those things. Stay away from that kind of talk. That's, that's stupid talk. So be aware of that. This is probably not the best time to share some of these things, but in some ways it is the best time to share these things. God, help me to share loving words. Would you commit today to let no corrupt thing come out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of what? Edifying. That it might minister grace to the hearers. That's what we want to have. We want to be full of God's beautiful, rich grace. Back to Psalm 142. Psalm 142, verse 5 to 7. I cried out to you, O Lord. I said, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise your name. And the righteous surround me, for you, uh, you shall deal bountifully with me. The word bountifully, to, or deal, is to repay goodness, to accomplish good. Here, the psalmist, in a sense, is, is choosing to trust God personally as his refuge. If you want key components of what lament looks like, just walk through what this sermon has just outlined for you and how that we need to be ones that say, Lord, I'm going to cry out to you. I'm going to verbalize my prayer. I'm going to turn over to you, God. I'm going to voice my complaint, my, my anguish, my pain. And I'm going to cast it over to you, and I'm going to personally make you my refuge. This prayer of pain is about learning to trust God. The test really is, in pain, who are you trusting to handle this? There's only one who is able, and it's not you. Today, as you uh, think on these things, I'm also reminded, Philippians 4.8 Make sure you're thinking true things, lovely things. Make sure that you're casting all your anxieties upon him, Philippians 4, 6. Put it all there, and those bad memories, those hard memories, let them be renewed in your mind with a, through the view of who your God is. That is what's necessary. Today, are you turning your sorrows into prayerful conversations with God? You won't find hope by running away from your sorrows. Next, be careful of what you dwell on, Philippians 4, 8, and 9. Think on good things and promote new godly memories. Prepare, beware of re-dramatizing your griefs. Can I say another thing? Sometimes people are so possessive, taking over others when they, they're grieving. Can I warn you not to do this? I saw people come into our house and they took everything that was my mom's belongings. I'm like, I, I didn't want that to go. Sometimes people think the only way you can heal is just remember, all, get rid of all the pictures. No, you take your filthy fingers off those pictures. They're special. Don't touch them. Maybe you should make copies for them. Maybe you can find some more pictures because maybe she was always the one behind the camera instead of the one getting pictures taken. Figure out ways to love that honors the dead that loves those who are bereaved, that they would be able to walk through this with victory and with trust. Next, draw close to God and your family and your church family. Those are keys to what you need to go through these things. God has given the church to be a fellowship of suffering at times that goes through and has been through the same thing. I'll never forget every funeral that we've ever had where there was the death of a spouse. I will see outside at different times after most people are gone the most meaningful time of the entire day. Three or four widows and widowers who have never really had much contact before. But they all have their head down. And they're together. And it's one of the most meaningful times they have ever had in their life. Because they've all been through that valley. And there is a fellowship in suffering, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. When you suffer, God says you suffer so that you might love others, 2 Corinthians 1. 
that they might know the God of comfort through how you handle these things. I just commit that to your challenge.